Robert Irving III collaborated with the legendary Miles Davis in his composition Space, inspired Davis's comeback in 1979. He soon evolved into the roles of Davis's producer, musical director, and film composer to become the, first, the jazz icon's longest collaborator from 1979 to 1988. As a musician and producer of three Grammy Award-nominated projects, Irvin worked closely with countless music greats, including Carlos Santana, Wayne Shorter, Ramsey Lewis, Billy Joel, Diane Reeves, David Murray, Regina Carter, Gary Bartz, Pharaoh Sanders, John Schofield, Sting, Grover Washington, I'm getting tired now, Junior, <laughs> Nona Hendrix, George Duke, Patricia, Patrice Russian, Nancy Wilson, Brantford Marcellus, Roy Ayers, R. Kelly, and served as musical director for Donald Bird and the, and the Sister Sledge. Good evening. And thank you again for coming out. Thank you, Quincy, for the invitation to publish in this really great and beautiful issue. I've immensely enjoyed each of these speakers. I could have spent the whole time just listening to any one of them. Um, 17 years ago, I was introduced to a young French saxophone player by the name of Laurence Desteval. And three times during that uh, 17 years, I proposed to her three times. And last year she said yes, and she's here tonight, and I just want to say thank you to my lovely wife, my beautiful wife. Um, and and I'll, I want to say thank you because she, uh, she's a saxophonist, and she uh, had a choice of, of being on stage with George Clinton tonight at B.B. King's playing, and she chose to be here with her husband. So I really... <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> and I didn't rob the grave. She she looks about twenty five years younger than she is. So <laughs> but anyhow, this um, actually marks the thirtieth anniversary of the, uh, Miles Davis's performance at the historic Jazz Jamboree in Warsaw, Poland, uh, in uh, on actually on October twenty seventh, um, nineteen eighty three. And that happened to be my birthday. And it was also the f my first performance with Miles. And I still remember very, uh, very vividly um, how the soldiers and tanks from the former USSR occupied Poland at that time to enforce martial law. And it was the first time that a jazz artist performed behind the Iron Curtain, our performance. And even until this day, people who were present at that performance say the music announced the sound of freedom for them. And so in 1983, around that time, I had just produced the album Decoy for Miles. And he wanted to start integrating that music into uh, the live performances. So he appointed me as musical director initially to begin that process. And so the following is an excerpt from my memoir. Uh, Harmonic Possibilities is the title, and rather than you know read something um, that's been published in the magazine, I chose a segment from around that time, 30 years ago, that sort of exemplifies the personal and working relationship dynamics that Miles and I shared, while also giving you a, a little glimpse into my uh, childhood. So it reads as follows. Uh, I hung out with Miles in the hotel suite in Copenhagen, Denmark during late 1984 as, as we enjoyed a rare day off from the fall tour in Europe. And I watched with fascination as his, his pen sauntered with meticulous ease in every direction on his medium-sized sketch pad. Black inked feminine forms and abstractions came to life, dancing onto his receptive white palette. My very patient manuscript paper laid spread open across the glass tabletop awaiting the strokes of several intrigued number two pencils as I toiled on a transcription and arrangement of a tune called Roses by English singer-songwriter Nick Kershaw. And Miles loved the work of Nick Kershaw, and so he wanted to do an arrangement uh, with the band. So Bobby, you like this Nick Kershaw material, don't you? Miles asked as if he was proud to have discovered such a unique artist. And I said, yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting, different from anything you've done. 
Exactly. He said, looking forward, you know, not backwards. I mean, all that old shit we play is cool, right? But who wants to keep eating leftovers, no matter how good they taste? I said, yeah, well, that's a good way to look at it. That's right, Bobby, because, you know, people are always trying to get me to go back, play that old shit. Miles, is con he continued, I mean, it was great when we played it, and it still is, but some things just belong in a museum and make room for something new. But Bobby, there's not a lot of space for improvisation in the rhythm section, you know what I mean? Unless you hear some real slick shit. But from what I can hear, it's not that kind of a thing. Kind of an odd, quirky tune. I guess that's why I like it. And then Miles began to sing the, the chorus for the song, Everything's Coming Up Roses, Coming Up Smelling Like Roses, or So They Say. And I always found it hilarious uh, to hear Miles sing pop tunes, which he did quite often. I think the funniest thing I heard him sing was uh, Who's Gonna Drive You Home Tonight by the Cars. Just crazy. <laughs> so Miles asked, so do you think the rhythm section should, will be able to handle that groove? And so I reassured him, I, I can't see why not. I mean, the patterns aren't that complicated, and it's just a question of the eventual arrangement and what rhythms are dictated by the direction. So Miles cautioned me, okay, Bobby, you better get it right. So I'm going to let you work, because if you don't get it right, it's curtains. I said, oh, shit, well, I, I guess I don't have a choice. So we both sat for about a half an hour without any exchange of words, and Miles finished his sketch and started on a new one. And we shared a mellow, secure silence that could only exist among friends with nothing to prove to each other or themselves. But Miles eventually broke the silence by asking me the question. He said, Bobby, I've been meaning to ask you, why you play like you got the Holy Ghost? Well, he didn't seem poised for an exhaustive explanation from me, and, and I had no inclination to give him one either. But somehow, his question hit a psychological hot button, like a Google or YouTube search, turning up videos from my past, from my distant past. And Miles' question rang more like a highly intuitive, enlightened observation for me. Initially, I smiled wryly, quietly grabbing a, a large Concord grape from the bowl of fruit on the table, and then several more for comfort, poise, and maybe distraction. And if he had looked up at me at that moment, I, my appearance would certainly be that of a Cheshire cat caught. Now, in considering my response to him, my rational mind jumped in to hypothesize that well, most impro improvisers close their eyes and play with feeling, as if channeling some unseen source of inspiration. And I tried to convince myself that his words alluded to this. Because during our concerts, we often found ourselves entrained by the music. Whenever we crossed over into that zone, in that zone of transcendence, Sometimes we all seem to be in telepathic communication with each other. Sometimes two or more of us would even improvise synchronized melodic voice leading events or identical rhythmic phrases simultaneously as if the music had been composed that way. And whenever that happened, no member of the audience could have possibly felt any more mesmerized than we did ourselves. And at those moments, surely the music didn't come from us. It flowed through us. So consequently, I thought, the fact that Miles is euphemistically referred to as the Prince of Darkness speaks of his musical wizardry as the facilitator of such a flow. Or was it the moving of the Holy Ghost, as Miles seemed to infer with his question? And what he, could he possibly know about that? So my subconscious mind soon grew weary of these diversionary tactics, ob obviously designed to delay the pressing of a replay button of a childhood experience. And so Miles' question apprehended that childhood memory, cued it up, and now pressed play. 
The video started with an episode in which I feigned speaking of tongues at my Uncle Bill's church in North Carolina at the age of nine. The incident occurred in early August of 1963, about two weeks before Martin Luther King's March on Washington. So just to paint this southern summer scene, my maternal grandmother, Ma, had taken my siblings and I on our fourth annual summer trip to New York, D.C., and Leakesville, North Carolina, now called Eden. Now, Ma's brother, Elder Bill Finney, conducted the last day of his week-long church revival on Saturday night. And I remember him as that foot-stomping, banjo-playing country preacher who sang like pop staples. Now, each of the six nights, at or after each of the six nights of the revival service, it was customary for those who had not received to tarry for the Holy Ghost, the evidence being the speaking of tongues. And seldom, though, did I ever hear a deviation from the select words uttered by the tongue speakers. So after the preaching, the invitation for discipleship went out, followed by the urging of the candidates for the Holy Ghost to begin chanting. They looked up at me with the anticipation that I would be the first to come and stand, walk up to the altar. And so it seemed to be voluntarily uh, mandatory. <laughs> so <laughs> I obliged. <laughs> so the music cranked up real loud. Uncle Bill's percussive banjo, tambourines, clapping, foot stomping, as they sang, power, power, Lord, Holy Ghost power, power, Lord. I closed my eyes and I began to do as I was being told. Say thank you, Jesus, son. Say it like you mean it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The cacophony itself intoxicated me as entrainment from the rapid repetition entranced. It seemed like a lazy hour crept by as I fought hunger and thirst. And uh, as a young boy who didn't want to disappoint my elders, I decided to let the gibberish flow. Hatsu Babalo Tashanda erupted from my lips, this being one of the phrases I'd heard time and time again. <laughs> Several big banded, wide hip women converged around me, clapping loud. And I can still smell the musky odors of sweet perfumed sweat commingled with double month gum breath wafting my way. And their wet words spattered on my face as they shouted, Hallelujah! Let him in, son! Now, in order to completely satisfy the learned protocols of behavior, I collapsed, actually exhausted, falling to the floor, but as was the routine, you know. And they were all very proud of me. But was I a fraud? Or, in my nine-year-old mind, did I simply feel pressured, obligated to validate their reality. So upon hitting the stop button on the video playing in my head, the question of Miles now reframed itself in my imagination with a different spin as, Bobby, do you play the piano like that because you got the Holy Ghost? <laughs> so I thought, well, what's the likelihood 22 years later after that experience that Miles Davis, the Prince of Darkness, would be in collaboration with a Holy Roller? I, find, I too found that to be very amusing, strangely amusing. But then again, maybe it wasn't so strange at all. Captives from West Africa forced into slavery in the Americas imported the practice of spirit dance with drumming to enter into a trance state and induce spirit possession as a part of their earth shrine spiritual practices. And those practices, of course, became integrated into the rituals of some African American churches. And in fact, the African cuckoo dance is identical to the holy dance, as I saw my grandmother, Ma, and Aunt Claudia do at Uncle Bill's church. And interestingly, the African spirit dances, dancers also collapse to the ground afterwards. So regardless of the veracity of my experience or the lack thereof, I knew when Miles and the band played in the flow, we transcended 3D reality to enter the realm of spirit and it felt real. But because I felt conflicted in my interpretation of what Miles' question actually meant, I simply decided to, to uh, 
treat it as a rhetorical observation. Intuitively, Miles seemed to sense my grappling with his question, and so he implored me, Bobby, don't play a single note unless you really mean it. And upon deeper reflection, I realized that he demanded authenticity as a kind of truth in musical expressionism. Although he encouraged creative freedom, it should be aesthetically informed and highly intentional. And Miles added another insight, ex explaining to me, silence is the music, Bobby, just like the sound. A profound, reflective silence reverberated his words, crystallizing my understanding that verbal, um, that nonverbal communication speaks perhaps more with more relevance, or, uh, relevance I'm sorry, than what is spoken. I'm going to read that again. A profound, reflective silence reverberated his words, crystallizing my understanding that nonverbal communication speaks with perhaps more relevance than what is spoken. And I began to get that music notes or musical notes are defined by the space in between them in the same way that the white space on his sketch pad defined the figures that seemed to dance onto the canvas. These important lessons empathically attuned me to the direction of the collective musical wave in every subsequent performance situ situation. And from that day on, I strived to be in service to the music as part of its support system. On, and that day with Miles, I continued to ruminate in the echoing layers of our expansive silence. <laughs>